Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Plas Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear. Welcome to another season of the Sports Hot Seat, and we've got a special one for you. Part one of a two-part series with two of the best ball players in the National League, maybe in all of Major League Baseball, Delino DeShields and Marquise Grissom. Also, of course, back this season, co-host Mitch Melnick. Mitch, welcome back. Welcome to you. And a very special welcome to uh, Messrs. Grissom and DeShields, who, uh, yes, are not only two of the finest ball players in uh, Major League Baseball, but uh, you're going to find out a little bit more about them off the field here and why they're as popular as they are. Guys, welcome. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> are you guys great friends? Are you bosom buddies? Are you just close friends? Or you just can't stand each other and this is all an act? Which is it? I don't know him. <laughs> hey, really, I don't, I don't like him too, like that. I mean, that's my boy and everything, but I don't like a lot of things that he does. Like? What, what don't you like that he does? We ain't going to get into that on TV. <laughs> but. Let me ask you a question. You guys are always associated with each other. You came up around the same time. Your careers have taken off about the same pace. Does it bother you at all that it's always Delino and Marquise or Marquise and Delino? It bothers me. <laughs> you know, like when you ask me to come on the show and you're like, I'm getting Delino too, and I'm wondering why can't you just, you know, get him on the show by himself or get me on the show by myself or whatever. That don't but, mean he don't like me, though. Yeah, that don't mean I don't like him, but That's everybody can put us together. Every time we do a card show, every time we go somewhere, they always say, Delino and Marquise, and every time I go somewhere, I'm Delino sometimes, and I'm not. But do you understand, Delino, why fans are so passionately enthusiastic about discussing the two of you together? When they talk about their team, Montreal Expos fans talk about Delino and Marquise as being those two great ball players playing great, exciting ball at the same time. Yeah, I can understand where they're coming from, but at the same time, they have to understand that we're individuals, and we have our own individualism, and, you know, you're, well, you're very different, in fact, obviously, right. as, as, right. as individuals. So what would you say, from a personality standpoint, your biggest differences are? He's stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know. People just don't, you know, they don't um, understand him or me as well as we understand each other. You know, I know myself, and he knows his, himself. And uh, that's why we get along. I, I know him, and I know how he is, and I know what he does. and. So I accept that, and that's that. And I don't go any farther, but, you know, people just think, you know, me and him do the same thing all the time, but we don't. Are you, would you say you're, you're closer to being ac actually opposites in terms of personality than? Well, I, I would just say that we, we grew up in two different parts of the country. You know, I'm, I'm from the north, and Marquis grew up in the south. And, uh, you know, a lot of things that he reacts to, I might not react to it, or I might react in a different way. So that's probably the biggest difference in us right there. Have you learned anything from your friendship with each other? Uh, must be a lot of similarities baseball-wise in how you've come up together. Well, it's just a lot of similar. Well, he's from a large family where I'm an only child. But uh, as far as our, our paths coming up, you know, through the ranks or whatever, there's a lot of similarities. Do you have a natural, uh, you know, I don't want to read too much into what's inside your head, but you, you what's 16, family of 16? Fifteen. Fifteen. And Delino's an only child. Do you feel a natural gravitation towards being a brother because of your upbringing? Hmm. Mm -mm. No? <laughs> <laughs> got enough, got enough got brothers here. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't need another one. <laughs> nah, I look at him as, you know, as a friend. We played together in double A, triple A, and we pretty much came into big leagues at the same time. And um, it's just we've been at the same stage and at the same level, and we try to teach each other as we go. We never stop learning, and that's why we get along, too, because we communicate well. We're about the same age, and we came through at the same time. Do you share some of the same interests off the field in terms of music, hobbies, or movies, or books, or whatever, anything like that? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> Music-wise, and going out together, and but he read a little bit more than I do. He try to uh, educate himself a little bit more, and I don't do too much reading, but everything else, we pretty much do the same thing. 
Now, you, you each have a child that's close to the same age. You just had uh, little Bop. I don't know if you call him that yet, but uh, Delino Jr., I guess. Uh, eight months old now. Mm -hmm. Got a son, 14 months old. Mm -hmm. Your kids had a chance to, to meet each other, I would imagine, uh, during the off season or at least in, in, in Palm Beach during uh, spring training. Yeah, they, they done kicked it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they running around. They're going to have plenty of time to do that. Marquise's kid must be beating on your kid. He's, he's he six tried months to. old. He, he tried already to. Beat him. <laughs> he already getting yeah. it. Is, is fatherhood what you guys thought it was going to be like? I mean, there's a lot more to it than wait. I mean, believe me, just wait a couple more years. But uh, is it pretty much what you thought it would be? Is it better? Uh, it give me something to look forward to other than baseball. You know, I can go 0 for 4 or go 4 for 4, and, and after the game I'm thinking about my son. And it just, it just made me a better person, a stronger person, and I don't have to worry about myself anymore. It's, it's not just me. It's, it's my son now. So it's been a big difference, but my main concern is, is the uh, well-being of my son now. I interviewed you, Delino, in spring training, talked about how your son changed your life, and you said that he did change a lot of the outlook and, and philosophy you had about life when uh, Delino was born. Yeah, well, I've... Growing up only child, I've basically looked after myself, been concerned with myself, and I've done everything for, you know, for me. And uh, now all of a sudden I got this little one, and it does change you a bit. It's just not just me anymore. You know, I got to look out for him now. Has it changed the way you react to other people, not just to your wife and to your child? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not as judgmental anymore, you know, because uh, I got to raise my son and do the best I can with him. How, how, judge, how quick were you to judge before? Real quick. Because I just felt like, you know, if it was wrong, I was going to tell you about it. You know, I might be wrong, I might be right, but I don't do that anymore because I know that, uh, you know, my son's going to be looking at me, so I got to do the right things for him. Have you guys thought about, because of what you do for a living, how you're going to uh, relate to your, your kids, your son at this point, your sons? Uh, they're going to grow up watching you be in the spotlight. And uh, it's, it's, it's not like most other fathers who work nine to five or whatever. <clears throat> have you thought about how you might handle that? I have. Well, um, I think just, just, just along the way, each year, as he grow older, just, just, you know, tell him to, you know, education first and to be himself and, and, and to be real and just, just take him through as, as I came through. You know, it was, it was different for me. Just be yourself. You know, when I when I came up, but he gonna have better things than than I had when I was his age, and better living conditions and everything. So I, I hope he use that to an, as an advantage and, and and move on and and be even, you know, better than I was. You both of you must be very proud that you're gonna be able to provide so much more for your family, than than what you had growing up. Well, I think that's every man's, you know wish or whatever just to be able to provide for his family and uh, not a lot of African-American men are able to do that so of course it feels good. What do you think you'll do differently? Your kids will grow up with millionaire, multi-millionaire fathers and you're gonna have to keep those kids leveled down to the ground. It's a whole different mindset I imagine than what you grew up with. They won't have to work that hard to get the things that you had to work hard to get. Yeah they will. <laughs> I mean, my son, he's going to have to earn what he gets. You know, he's going to have, you know, he's going to have a lot of love and a lot of this, that, and the other, but he's going to have to earn it. You think you'll spoil your kids at all? I or they'd be automatically spoiled having Marquis Grissom and Delano DeShields as fathers? Already. They already. My son is already spoiled to a certain extent because I'm not there, you know, you know every day. And um, she buys him everything, and he has everything. And, but he's going to have to work for, for everything, I think. You know, just because we got it, I'm not going to just just keep giving and giving and let him keep making mistakes. It's starting now, though. You know, you can't wait till you get four or five and, and try to discipline your child. I don't want to talk to you as if you're the same person because we've already been through that. Are either or both of you going to be strict fathers, real authoritarian fathers? I don't think I, don't think I will be. Well, me, personally, you know, I feel like... Uh, Discipline is, is something that we've gotten away from. It's like, oh, you can't beat the children and this, that, and the other. But I got beatings when I was young, and uh, it teaches you sometimes when you don't listen and mind your parents. Sometimes you got to go upside their head. <laughs> you know, so I'm not saying I'm going to beat my kid to death or nothing like that, but, you know, if he, if he gets out of line, I got something for him. Describe your childhoods in 30 seconds. 
more they like. 60, you can take 60, 60. it's okay. <laughs> Mine was long, <laughs> <laughs> hard. I did a lot of things. I, I learned a lot when, during the ages of um, probably six through 15. I think that's where I got all my discipline. My mom and dad did an excellent job, I think, raising 14 out of 15 kids. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I have to thank them for a lot of my stuff, you know, for the things that I did in my, to my um, success right now. Childhood in Seaforth, Delaware? It was pretty much like anybody else's, I guess, you know. Not a lot of money, a lot of love, grow up fast. You basically, you basically took care of your mom, though, didn't you? Well, I mean, uh, just here recently, when I got into pro ball, I had the opportunity to finally do something for my family. And that was uh, probably the biggest reason why I didn't go to college. You know, I just wanted to help my family out. I think most, most Montrealers know that, uh, that you could have played basketball. And you still play basketball, but obviously not for a living. Uh, have you ever given it any thought that, geez, if I had just waited or maybe, I'd, you know? Sometimes. I don't have regrets, though. You know, I just wonder sometimes if I could play in that league, you know, with Michael and Patrick and all those guys. Marquise, was sports a big part of your uh, growing up outside of baseball? Did you do any other sports growing up? Yeah, I played Pretty much everything. He can hoop too. Can he? He, he can no, ball a little bit. I yeah. can't hoop not like him. him. No, I can't, can't hoop play him. him. I tried to guard him in Atlanta hoop with in the basketball me, game and he hit 30 points on me. <laughs> NBA threes. What'd you play? Football? I played football and basketball. And um, playing sports in high school, that was my way of staying out of trouble. I had to play. If I didn't play sports, I would have had all the extra spare time after school and I think I would have took the wrong direction. But that's just a decision I had to make at that time. And I made the right decision. I think I did. <laughs> Hope so. Did yeah. you, did you, uh, Delino, uh, I, mean, I think it's fair to say you're still learning baseball. When did you first pick up a glove? I guess I was uh, seven. My dad, I remember my dad taking me out and buying me my first glove. I was seven years old. And did you use it a lot? Yeah, I played a lot of baseball when I was young, but I, I didn't have the... Uh, the love for that game that I had for basketball, you know, it was it was just something that the neighborhood kids did, you know, whatever season it was, that's what we played. Do you, we, didn't do you, play, we didn't play hockey though. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you acquired a love for baseball? Well, yeah, I'm. Uh, it's my livelihood. I mean, that's what I do now. So yeah, I do have a bit more passion for it than I did. Bobby Hurley of Duke talks about playing so much basketball in Pennsylvania in the projects and that's why he became the ball player that he did. Is there a certain camaraderie about project basketball that you just can't find in, in organized baseball? Well, you, well, project baseball or project basketball would be uh, like sandlot baseball. I mean, just picking up some, some cardboard and throwing it out there and going at it, you know, that's, that's what I could compare it to. Did you play sandlot baseball? Yeah, that's Stick ball, all, wall ball. That's all we had. You know, we didn't have uh, umpires out there in, in back <laughs> of the school. <laughs> we just went at it, you know. Same thing for you? Yeah, basically. You know, me and my little brother, we used to play all the time, and my next door neighbor. And that's all we do. We get a tennis ball and a, a bat or a stick every day, after school, every day. Who did you want to be? Who did you pretend to be? Nobody at the time. I was. Me either. I never. Uh, I didn't want to really want to be nobody. I wasn't into baseball that tough until I got drafted. You both, you both grew up without a lot of money, which means you have a lot of friends, probably that didn't have a lot of money either. Um, what are a lot of your friends doing now? You guys have become multi-millionaire professional marquee. Well, marquee's a good word. Marquee baseball players. What did a lot of your friends end up doing back from Seaforth and from Georgia? Well, a lot of my friends are. I, I mean, I call it in the belly of the beast right now. They, they in jail. And um, then a lot of them are still there trying to do the best they can. Does you it know? hurt you? It does. It does. But uh, everything happens for a reason, you know. Just like me getting the chicken pox this year. <laughs> yeah, what was that reason? Uh, <laughs> Give Mike uh, Lansing a shot, I guess. That's right. That's right. Because coming out of camp, he didn't expect to play a lot, you know. And um, then all of a sudden, I get sick, and boom, he's in there. So you'll sacrifice your chicken pox for his 400 batting average? That's right, as long as we win. Marquise, what a lot of your friends uh, Um, 
during my time growing up in, in high school, I didn't have real, real, real close, close friends. I had about three or four, and I still got them. I know a lot of people that, when I went off to college, that I knew, but they weren't really that close to me, that are, like he said, in jail, dead, or on drugs, or selling drugs, or whatever. But, you know, that, that was a thing, you know, back in 1985 or whenever we were in high school. But I had a couple of guys that I was real close to, and most of them are married and got families and, and doing well. And I only had like two or three, so, and two of my brothers. So I still got my same friends. Is there anything that you guys feel that you could do maybe if, if, if this much to help the next generation of uh, Afro-American uh, young kids who are underprivileged, don't have maybe seemingly a shot? Uh, anything you guys think you can do? Show them the right way or tell them anyone can make it? No, I think the best thing I could do is just to raise my son or my children or I don't know if I'm going to have any more. That's up to my wife, you know, but just raise my, my, my children and do the best by them. That's the best thing I think I can do. What, what does history tell you, though? That the family is important. That's what it tells me, and that's something that uh, the black community right now is, is hurting. The family is hurting because the men are not there. And uh, we have to be there for our kids. You know, we're making babies and this, that, and the other, but we're not really there raising them, and that's what it's all about. You know, you got to raise them up to, to be the persons that you want them to be. And why has that happened? The system. I mean, you know. It's, it it's didn't the, just start. <laughs> it's the system. <laughs> Is it getting better? No. You don't see any improvement at all? I mean, it's hard to see improvement. You watch CNN every night and you just see gang that's, warfare that's, going that's on in the inner cities do. of just, every just city. Just watch the news, read the papers, and you can see it's not getting better. And the family to you is the, uh, that's where it's got to start with the family. That's right. You feel the same way? Yeah, because if, if, my, if my mom and dad didn't raise me the right way and, you know, left me out there to make decisions, you know, when I need to make the, the right decision, you know, I probably wouldn't be here today. And, and it all started at home. Do you guys have any faith in any politician anywhere or any, any public figure anywhere uh, who can, who can make a difference? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in nothing. I don't trust nobody. I don't. That's I just a, go. That's a pretty tough negative attitude to have, though. Cynical. I mean, justified. That's probably justified. Cynical. To a certain extent. <laughs> I think politicians are cynical. But we're not talking about that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That's no, that's fine. But I mean, is there has there any anywhere been somebody who you said, yeah, you know, he, think, he or think, she is right, and if they had a chance, I think uh, probably the two best political people that have ever been on the scene are John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, and they both were killed. So that that right there told me something. Somebody didn't want them around. So uh, I don't I don't see any. Anybody else coming? In your bio, in the media guide, at least in the 92 media guide, um, one of your idols was Malcolm X, so I would assume you would throw him in. Well, I didn't, I didn't really look at Malcolm as politically or, or political. You know, he was more spiritual and... But he had the right idea? Yeah. Did you see the movie Malcolm X? Yeah. Did you? you? Yeah, of course I did. Mm. You like it? The way it was done? Not really. What didn't you like yeah, about it? It was because uh, it made it seem like the Muslims were solely responsible for killing this man, and that wasn't the way it was, you know. There was a lot of uh, undermining that went on, you know. Just a lot was left out there that uh, could have been told. Surprised you that Spike Lee would leave some of that stuff out? Well, that, I mean, ever since, uh, ever since I heard what Spike said about Dion last year, was it? Yeah. I'm not surprised about, about this man, you know. Even though I like his work and but that, ever since then, I, I just, uh, I don't know about my man's what, what did he say about Deion Sanders? He, he basically, uh, you probably maybe remember it better than I do, he was saying that Dion was, uh, was white, basically. Dion is uh, well, He was talking about how did they put this, this bum or this idiot on the cover. What was it? What was the magazine he was talking uh, about? It was... Um, Sports Illustrated, maybe? It might have been. Anyway, he was just calling them all these names and stuff. And he I'm ripped like, apart Deion Sanders as not being representative of the black community at all and not really being an Afro-American at all. And uh, there's a lot of controversy about that. Obviously, Dion just shook it right off. But uh, yeah, someone like Delina, who's, a, who's <clears throat> an Afro-American athlete, was unable to shake it off. 
Are you a Spike Lee fan? Uh, mm -mm. What kind of movies I don't do even you like? go to movies. What kind of movie? You don't go to movies I've at all? I've been to five movies probably in my whole lifetime. You must have a favorite then. Not, not, not too, <laughs> not too <laughs> tough to remember. Five. My whole life. <laughs> I just don't go to movies. Television? You watch any television? Well, every now and then, you know, past time, but don't really get into one certain, you know, big um, scene or anything. I watch Martin. That's about my favorite show. And that's it. Martin who? They, Martin I guess Lawrence. they don't show Martin. They don't show Martin up here. <laughs> a little slow, a little behind. Up yeah, is that, is that <laughs> Martin Lawrence a talk show? No, no he's got a comedy. Show. It's a sitcom. Okay. I got that. There's another sitcom. Um, now I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, it's, a, it's a black sitcom. Damon Wayans is in it. Live in, Live in Color. Color. Live in Color. You ever watch that one? Yeah, but not, you not can't one of your to Martin. No. So let me let me ask you guys. Playing. While we're on, we somehow got onto the subject about the Bill the Bill Cosby show. There are a lot of people who who didn't like the representation of uh, of that family as being uh, representative of what Black America was about, and they thought it was unrealistic. And others responded to that by saying, "Well, what do you mean? You you can't have a successful Black family in America? I mean." Did you have any problems with the Cosby show? Mm -mm. Thought it was a great show. And I feel like every, uh, we all deserve to live like that. I mean, like the Huxtables were living. You know, they were living large, so to speak. But I feel like we all deserve the, the best things in life, you know. Nobody should be homeless, out there starving, and all that. Bill Cosby's a doctor in that show. Mm -hmm. His wife is a lawyer in the show. Kids are all going to school. To me, that's a great show to have. Better to have a show like that than any other. Now right. you have the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which is completely, I, I, I mean, different than Cosby. It's the high living, but more unrealistic, not because the characters are black, yeah. but just the way the whole show is, is put together. It's trying to take off on Cosby, but it's not. But I, I tend to agree with Marquise and Delano that that's a, that's a good show. Uh, you got a lawyer and a doctor, why not? Not only... Uh, Same kind of sweater. Yeah. Oh, got a great collection of sweaters mm -hmm. on this show. Who, who helped you the most in becoming a successful Major League Baseball player? Mm, good question. Too far as, far as what? Far just, as just somewhere, somewhere along the way who, who may have had a little more input than somebody else, who you remember more fondly than somebody else, perhaps. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a whole bunch of people. You know, my mom, my dad, my high school coach, college coach. And, but it, it all started, you know, with myself. Working hard. Didn't nobody tell me to work hard, do extra work. You know, didn't nobody stay on me all the time. You know, I had to drive myself. And, but a whole bunch of people just, you know, helped here and helped there. And, but to pick, you know, one person that really stood out, I really couldn't say. What about yourself? Uh, there's, like you said, there was a lot of people, but one man stands out in my mind. His name is Gene Glenn. And uh, he was uh, a coach with us some years ago, and uh, he, he just stayed on me all the time, you know, he just, he wanted to see me get better, and uh, I want to say thanks if he's watching out there somewhere, you know. Mm -hmm. he's, well, getting, he's getting better. <laughs> <laughs> what, go ahead. Now, were you uh, in your neighborhood in Seaforth at 15, 16 years old? Seaford. Seaford. Seaford, yeah. got it. Okay. Were you uh, the star of the neighborhood? I mean, Delino, you got to see Delino plays hoops. Baseball, this guy's going to be a pro athlete one day. Was that the word? A lot of clippings in the Seaford newspaper? Yeah, well, there was a lot of clippers, but to me, I wasn't the best player in the neighborhood. You know, there were other guys that, that I even looked up to that did make it. Has anyone else ever come out of Seaford other than you? No. You're like the Seaford guy. We got a couple more on the rise right now, though. A uh, kid uh, with the Oakland organization, Mike Neal. And a uh, kid is with the Padres now. He was with Toronto last year. He got traded in the Darren Jackson deal. Him and Derek Bell, Stoney Briggs, and another kid with the Brewers. So we got a few more coming. Is there a sign yet as you enter Seaford, Delaware, home of Delino? Nah. Haven't done that yet? Nylon <laughs> capital of the <laughs> world. The key. <laughs> That's it. How about you, Marquise? Uh, were you like the man in the neighborhood when you were growing up? No, nah, like he said, you know, it was a lot of guys that I looked up to, too. Because I played with guys that were, you know, five and six years older than me, maybe ten, and I competed against them. I think that's a big reason why I'm, I was 
getting his, better. His neighborhood time. was a lot bigger than mine, too. <laughs> he got, there's a lot of boys in his neighborhood. Yeah. You had to hold your ground, too. What's, what's uh, the deal with your socks now? Last year you had them up and you said it was your tribute to all of those who paved the way for you and the, the, the Negro League and so mm -hmm. on. Now they're back down. Well, I still, I still think I have a... That baggy look. Yeah. yeah the baggy I mean, you know, you it's still, it might be a different era now. You know, maybe last year was the, the 20s or the 30s. Now it's, it's moving on up. You're like a chameleon. I mean, you change. That's right. That's right. You do it on purpose. I do. Try to keep people a little bit off. Yeah. <laughs> Try to keep, you know, this is my own thing, you know. <laughs> so they can say, yeah, that's the Shields right there. They've been saying a lot of that lately. Mm -hmm. All the time. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> do you have, do you have a, a, obviously you do, do you have as much an appreciation of the sport and the guys who went before you as Mr. De, uh, De Shields does? Oh, yeah. I do. You know, it went for those guys. It wouldn't be no arbitration, no free agency and all of that. And I'll go back and I talk to Tommy Harper a lot and he pretty much educate me on how it was back in the day. And, you know, we can't do anything but thank those guys and try to make it even better for the next generation that's coming to play ball. You never had to drink from a water fountain that said, one said whites, one said blacks. You never had to go into a restaurant and say, no, you can't eat here, the rest of the team. But see, that's, that's, that's what I was talking about earlier. I mean, Marquise grew up in the South, and he saw a lot of that stuff. Whereas I grew up in the North, and I, I really didn't see it. And so now all of a sudden, I get exposed to things like that at a, at a later age, and I react more differently than he does. Whereas he's more, uh, when he sees stuff like that now, he doesn't, you know, react as quickly, you know, because he's seen all that, and he knows uh, how to handle it a bit better than I do. But for me, you know, I just can't, I, I don't tolerate things like that. Are you angrier as a, as a result? I think You're so. You're angrier than he is. Yeah. Is that fair? Is that... Yeah. And and he, he helps me out. Time, he helps me out with that stuff. At the time, yeah. I was angry. I've been in a grocery store. I know I'm talking about this. This hasn't been been about 20 years ago. I don't seen a lady walk right in front of my mom in the grocery store, and just go, you know. So little things like that. And but he he has a right to be angry because that's 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 not right. Period, but it's been going on for years and it hasn't changed. It's getting worse. We'll continue. We'll continue this conversation about racism. We'll talk about Marquise's arbitration hearing a few months Everybody ago. I want to talk about racism these days. On the next edition of uh, and the Sports baseball. Hot Seat, yeah. exactly. <laughs> we have some nice gifts from Starter, though. Uh, Marquise is a big fan of uh, Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, whereby Delino is a big fan of uh, Randall Cunningham, no longer Reggie White of the Philadelphia Eagles, and uh, Starter's given us uh, a bunch mm -hmm. of real nice stuff. We'll be oh, back yeah. next week on the Sports Hot Seat with Marquise Grissom <laughs> and Delino DeShields, and we'll continue. Thanks a lot. Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Plaza Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear.